How about that? All right. Turn that fan on. A lot of hot air up here this evening. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're going to read verses 7 through 10. 7 through 10. Um, it says, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and uh, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we... Thank you tonight that you've allowed us to be here. We thank you for your word. We beg for your presence tonight, Lord. We just ask that you would give us the strength, give us the wisdom, give us the words that we might preach the word of God. We ask that your blessing be upon each and every one of us, that we would hear, that we would receive, that we would obey your word. Forgive me my sins. Enable me to preach. All these things we ask in the precious name of your son, that you would receive the glory. Amen. Amen. I was telling them earlier that I was going to call this the walk of faith, and then I thought, well, we could say walk this way. That might get more attention, uh, you know, walk this way. But in any event, uh, whatever the title ends up being, we are talking about the walk of faith, the way that we should walk. Paul here tells the Corinthians believers, we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, that's a difficult thing, is it not? To walk by faith and not by sight. As we look around, and uh, I think it was a, a week or so ago, I preached about um, Elisha and his servant, and he asked that the Lord would open his servant's eyes that he would see. Faith gives us eyes that see things that we might not normally perceive as we walk by faith by the way i will say this this thought entered my head just a second ago and i almost lost it uh, it doesn't take long uh, but um, i believe that the more we walk by faith the easier it becomes it, but the more habitual it comes, the more easy it is that we would trust. And I was thinking about something that I, back when we were in Ohio, and um, saw something on the news about those that were physically blind. And it says a lot of their, what they do is they are, their muscle memory is so used to where things are that they are able to walk around their houses and just walk the correct number of spaces and know where they are. And I, I believe they might have even said, you know, that you could walk around your house if you walked around your house for a while. So I decided I'd give it a try. We started our, in our bedroom, which was all the way down the hall. As I will start in the bedroom, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to attempt to walk into the kitchen. In order to do that, I had to come out the bedroom door, take a right, walk down the hall so far, take a left, and then walk into the kitchen. So I closed my eyes without practicing, without counting steps, without doing anything. You know what? I ended up in the kitchen. I ended up in the kitchen. Why? Because I had made that walk so many times over so many years that I just inherently knew how to walk, where to walk, how not to bump into things. I think the more we practice things, the easier it is and the better we do. These ladies that play the piano here at the church, they can tell you that the, uh, the more they practiced as they were learning, the longer they did it, the easier it became.
It is amazing how much of the, the New Testament, and, I, and I, I'm assuming the Old Testament, but I'm just thinking of the New Testament right now, how much of it talks about faith, how much hinges on faith. Verse 7 says we, it talks about our walks, perception. And as we've already mentioned, faith, not sight. It would be an easy thing for me to do to come and walk down these steps, sing. I don't know that I would have the courage to close my eyes and do that. Now, I could do that and maybe slowly feel, you know, slowly feel. Maybe that's the way we get through life. Some ways just kind of timidly walking and, and, and putting one foot. But even that is a walk of faith. Walking is just putting one foot in front of the other. Walking, by the way, is progress. Standing here in this spot, I'm not physically making any progress. Hopefully, my sermon is making progress. What I'm saying is making progress. But as far as moving, is not. I'm not progressing anywhere. Paul makes the assumption here that we are walking, that we are making progress, that we are going forward. Someone said, if we're not going forward, we're backsliding. There is no standing still. I don't think I'm standing still. Oh, I'm in the same place spiritually as I was 20 years ago. No, you're either ahead or you're behind. And what a shame that is. You remember Bill Clinton's question that he asked when he was running against uh, George, was it H. Bush that he was running? W. Bush, no, but H. Bush. He was running against uh, uh, Bush Sr., and he asked the question, and many people said that the, the election hinged on what he said. He said, ask yourself this question, are you better off today than you were four years ago? And people looked at themselves and said, well, I, I don't feel like I'm better off. We never feel, by the way, we never feel, you know, financially that we're doing what we should be doing. And it, and it is believed that many people voted on him because they had that question. They were like, oh, no, I'm not doing as well. And perhaps it's because they had done so well prior to four years ago that they didn't see any progress. Are you doing better spiritually than you were a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, ten years ago? We spend so much time reminiscing how great the good old days were. About how the, the, the churches were fuller. How people were more devoted. How the services were better. How people would get excited and, 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 and revved up. That's not faith's walk. That is not the walk of faith. It says we walk by faith and not by sight. It is not dependent on what we see. Matter of fact, Paul, I, I believe elsewhere, even makes the, the, the argument that if we see it, it's not really faith. I think there is, uh, or, or I guess it's what, what we, we don't really hope for what we see. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of the things, of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. As we walk by faith. By the way, walking by faith is a better, a better walk than walking by sight. You would think it would just be just the opposite. That we'd be more sure about it. As we're walking by faith, we're, we're trusting in the Lord. Many times we walk by sight and we see. Well, I'll give you an example. Not necessarily walking, this is climbing. We had Kyrie with us yesterday, and we went to the, um, the park. 
and we took a walk. We took the dogs for a walk, and we took uh, her, and we went to the play area. And we get to the play area, and there's this ladder tower or whatever. You could climb up on the outside. You could climb up the inside. It was, it was basically all just bars. And she got halfway up, and she couldn't go any further. Now, she said she couldn't climb any further. The, the rungs weren't any further apart than the ones down below. But as she got at a certain point, she saw how high she was. She saw where she was. She didn't see a way to progress, and she was stuck. She yelled for help. Well, she wanted him down. I had to go, and I had to climb in this thing that was about this big around, made for a child. Um, squeeze my way in there and get her down and then I've got her additional body, you know, and she's, uh, we're getting her down. But she looked around and she lost faith in her ability to go any further. Sometimes we look around and we can't go any further. We look at the world, we, we get discouraged, we can't go any further. The reason why many of our churches are dying is because we look around and we say our churches are dying. Maybe God's just trimming the fat. You ever think about that? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Things we do not see but believe. Once again, it's easy to believe in something you see. Many say, well, you, you, how do you believe in God? You can't see him. You can't hear him. You can't feel him. How do you believe in God? It's like, how can you not believe in God? You can see the world. You can see his hand in everything. The very fact that the, the, the earth is rotated on a certain axis and it revolves at a certain speed and it is at a certain distance from the sun and the other planets and the moon and everything works together shows us that there is a creator. It talks about things we don't see and, and, and encourages us, as a matter of fact, in those things that we don't see. And it says, the substance of things hoped for. Those are things we don't see yet. Those are things we don't see. What we hope for are things that we don't see yet. But by faith, we see them by hope. We possess them. Now walking by faith not only involves the things that we don't see and the things that we don't see yet, but walking by faith means that our, we are not destroyed by what we do see. We're not discouraged by what we do see. As a matter of fact, when you look around and see how things are turning out, that should give us more hope. That should give us more excitement because we know the time is near. Now to the Christian, we look around and, and the Bible says, uh, uh, when you see these things, look up, redemption draweth nigh. We preached not too long ago about how, how uh, we are closer now than when we first believed. So there's an encouragement in that. Well, the devil, it says he sees these things and he's going to send the beast with wrath because he knows the time is near. We see our walk's perception. We see the willingness to be in his presence in verse 9.
Let's read verse 8 as well, rather. I believe that's the, the verse I want anyway. We are confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now say, well, how is that be? I don't want to, but nobody seems to be in a hurry to die. Nobody seems to be in a hurry to die. And I've talked about this probably before. I know my wife's heard me talk about this and she's experienced it. We used to go to my uncle's church. They would have singing, um, maybe was it once a year or something like that? And they would have like an all day singing. And uh, we'd go there and people would get up there and testify, oh, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go and I'm ready to go. I had an aunt who lived to be what, 93, 93 years old. For She planned her funeral for a good 20 years. She's always talking about she was ready to go. She was ready to go. They got, uh, uh, my nephew got married in New Orleans and a bunch of them got on an airplane. My sister, my mom, uh, my aunt and her, uh, her daughter, my, my cousin, uh, they were on this airplane and they got some, into some rough turbulence. And she said, oh, we're going down. And my cousin said, well, you're always talking about you're ready to go. Let's go. And she just looked at her really mad and went, you shut up. You're ready to go. A dear brother who's went on to be with the Lord was uh, Frank Smith. And I've talked about Frank Smith over the years. Uh, one of my teachers pastored for many years. Uh, he talked about how his, his brother-in-law would get up. He, talk, he would ask his brother-in-law, said, every time you get up, you're talking about, oh, I'm, I'm looking for the Lord to come. I'm looking for the Lord to come. He said, well, if you're looking for the Lord to come, why did you buy that fu a fu a funeral plot? We may be ready to go, but we're not necessarily in a big hurry to go. I think of the story about a preacher who uh, was up there preaching and he said, now who wants to go to heaven? And everybody raised their hand with this one little boy. And he said to the little boy, don't, aren't you wanting to go to heaven? When the Lord comes, don't you want to, when you die, do you want, don't you want to go to heaven? He said, oh, I thought you were planning on taking a trip today. We want to go, just not today. But we're willing to be in his presence. Faith determines, by the way, that we will be in his presence. We're saved by grace through faith. It is our faith that enables us to trust him, that we would walk by faith and not by sight, that we would trust him and we would trust his hand, trust his mercy, trust his grace, trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ, that we might someday be in his presence. Faith gives us the assurance that someday we will be in his presence. The reason why Paul says that he knows that being absent from the body means to be present with the Lord is because by faith he has received these things and he knows Beyond a shadow of a doubt. Matter of fact, if you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you are to leave this body, whether it be tonight, next week, next year, whenever, if you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you would be present with the Lord, you need to get things right. You need to understand. You need to have that assurance. The Bible says that it was written. Let's go to that verse. Let me try to find it real quick. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. For these things I have written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. John said he wrote that epistle that they would know. He wanted them to have assurance that they were saved. Faith is not just hoping for the best when we die. Faith is not just hoping oh, uh, that, that all the boxes are checked when we die. Faith is knowing that Christ checked all the boxes. 
that, 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 that Christ bought and paid for our salvation. And we have the assurance, our assurance is in him. Makes a big difference. <laughs> if my assur assurance is in myself, that I've done enough, that I'm good enough, that I've stayed away from all the right things, there's no assurance in that. The assurance, the, the, the faith that we have, and faith is not just blindly hoping, faith is knowing. Faith is knowing. And the only way you can know is know that Christ did what you could not do. And we are assured because of what he did, we are saved. Now, I meant to make this point this morning, uh, since uh, most of you were, were here this morning, uh, I can go ahead and give it to you now. When I was talking about David and Goliath, I, I said that Goliath's faith was, and I, I don't think I use that term, but basically Goliath was trusting in himself. He was trusting in his own might. He was trusting in his own strength. He, he felt that he would deliver himself in the battle. That the victory came through what he was able to do. But David's strength, David's hope, David's faith, David's assurance was in what God would do. Did I mention Goliath thought he was all right? Faith directs our walk. Not only do we have faith that we would be in his presence when we're absent from the body, faith also tells us that he is present here in our lives today, right now, right this second. He is in the midst of us, Jesus is, when we gather together, the Bible teaches. But even when we separate, we go apart, he is there with us. Now, that, that should give us two things, at least two things that I can think of right now. That should give us the confidence that he is there and we are not alone. And we can rely on him and he guides us and he directs us. But it also should keep us from sin, knowing that he is there. He is not only our ever-present help in time of trouble, he is always there and sees everything that we do. So we see our walk's perception. We see our willingness to be in his presence. And finally, we see our work to please him. Our work to please him. Now, brother, you've been preaching about how we are not good enough and how we need him and we have to trust him by faith and it is his work that saves us. Yeah, but we need to work that he would be pleased with what we do. Now that we're not, not that we're redeemed, But because we're redeemed, we want to please him. Because we love him, we want to please him because we understand that he is watching and he is judging and he is rewarding. We want to please him. As a matter of fact, going back to Hebrews 11, which we quoted earlier, it also says that without faith, it is impossible to please him. So we're walking by faith. We're not walking by sight. With faith, we please him. And because of that faith, and since I'm jumping to uh, different Bible verses as they spring into my head, Book of Ephesians, and a very famous chapter 2. And I'm going to the wrong spot. There we go. Chapter 2. 
Now, we know these verses. We preach on these verses. These are, these are life verses that we live and we've been, been taught and we preach over and over again. And the reason why we preach them over and over again is because they're so vital and so important. It says in verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Now, we've already covered all that, have we not? So Brother Duncan doesn't need to continue on to that to preach anymore. But then that next verse is, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in him. We are not saved. And uh, you're like, oh, brother, you, we know this. This is Christianity 101. Well, let's go over it again. We are not saved by our works, but because of our salvation, we should work. There's something wrong with a salvation. There's something wrong with a faith where we not only where we don't just walk, but we work. Because after he says all that, he throws in in verse 9, wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. You know, he uses that word labor. Labor, and this is not just something we do when we get in the mood. This is not just something we do when, okay, we've got no choice. There are certain things that we put off because we don't want to do them. No, we should look forward to our work that pleases him. Our work should be persistent. As we've already mentioned, the, the more we do something and the more often we do something and the more familiar with it we are, we should be in the habit of working for the Lord. We should be in the habit of witnessing for the Lord. We should be in the, in the habit of reading our Bibles. We should be in the habit of, uh, of attending service and everybody I see here is in that habit. I don't see any unfamiliar faces. There's... Uh, matter of fact, the ones that are here right now, I would be more shocked if you weren't here than when you come through the door. You know, there's certain people you're surprised or you're like, oh, look, look who made it today. And there's other people, it's like, if they're not here, it's like something is wrong. Something has happened. They're sick. They've had a, 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 a flat tire. Something is wrong. Faith gives us a persistent work. It's not spotty. It's not shoddy. Just came up with that. You like that? It's constant. They said we labor. Not only does it talk about our persistence, it talks about our works, perspiration. Work isn't easy, is it? When Adam had to work, uh, the Lord said, it's by the sweat of your brow. When we work, it can be demanding. But isn't work also rewarding? Now we get, I believe we get rewarded when we're, we're doing the Lord's work. I believe we get rewarded here on earth. And I'm not talking about, you know, do a work so God will give you some material blessing. I'm just talking about the, the, the spiritual blessing. I, I, I'm talking about the blessing that we get when we're busy with the, at the Lord's work. When we're busy about the Father's business. But work is generally... Not easy. Work should be hard. As a matter of fact, if we get too comfortable, now what do we, we, we talk about work? What about working out? Um, I don't see any bodybuilders in here. I don't see any fitness models in here. But at the same time, we understand the concept of working out. When somebody works out, when, when, when somebody does physical exercise, whether it be lifting weights or, or some kind of aerobic activity, what happens after a while? Their bodies adapt. They get used to it. They get stronger. 
And it's not so hard work anymore, is it? Maybe they don't sweat as much. Maybe their, 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 their body isn't fatigued as much. Maybe they're not as sore the next day. And it's funny, I've noticed as I get older, I don't get sore the next day. Two or three days later, all of a sudden, it'll hit me. I don't know why that is. But in any event, what do those people do that are committed? They try to go up a level. If you're lifting a certain amount of weight, after you get used to that, the, the, the idea, the concept is lift more weight until you get used to that. We're content to get to a certain point and then just stay there. Our work no longer becomes a walk. We start to coast. You ride a bicycle, you're going up a hill, you got to pedal. Steeper the hill, you got to pedal harder. The more uh, exertion you have to put into it. But you get to the top of the hill, what, what happens? You go down and you just coast at that point. Sometimes we just coast as Christians. We're just willing to, to go and enjoy the ride. But when we're coasting, it's... <laughs> You're not coasting uphill, you're coasting downhill. We're going downhill when we're coasting. This is good stuff. Somebody ought to write this down. This isn't me, this is God talking. I didn't have any of these ideas before I stood in this pulpit. Our work's participation. He says in verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. God's not going to judge you by what the Baptists do. God's not going to judge you by what this church does or your particular group in the church. God is going to judge you by what you do. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. in our worthy production. We will receive the things done in his body. Not in our body. You know, we often think we, you're, if, while we're still alive, you know, we preach on that. While we're, we can only work while we're still alive. We can only be busy while we're still alive. We can, we can only uh, uh, earn rewards while we're still alive. After we're dead, after this, the judgment. You know, that's the cutoff point. This is the things we've done in his body, is his body, is the Lord's body, is the, the Lord's church. Matter of fact, God has not authorized any other organization than the Lord's church. According to what he hath done, whether it is good or bad. And I think I, I kind of twisted that scripture a little bit. I want to go back. Um, you know, we point out when other people twist scriptures and stuff, probably what that is saying, you know, I talk about his body, be the body of Christ, but I think it's talking about each individual's body. So just strike that stuff. But according to what he had done, whether good or bad, we are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We are going to stand uh, in that judgment seat. I believe I've said this not too long ago, and I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this verse because I know I've preached it and I preached it and I preached it. But at the same time, it was part of our, our, our text, and I, I wanted to point it out a little bit. But we are not judged on whether we're saved or not at this judgment seat. The very fact that we're at the judgment seat means that we are saved. There's a whole different judgment for the lost, the great white throne judgment. And once again, I've said it over and over again, don't want to take a lot of time. But we are judged by the amount of reward. 
And the terror that we have and the fear that we have that Paul talks about is not losing our salvation, but losing reward that we could have had. That reward is eternal. That reward, you know, it's like this is your payment and this is what you're going to have through eternity. There's no more opportunity to earn reward. And I believe that's what the terror is. Now, if you believe that, that's faith. And if you have faith, you're going to walk and you're going to work and you're going to desire to please him. That our work would be accepted. The only work that's going to be accepted is the work that we do in his name. Would you stand?